Okay, here we are for Journey Road Ministries, William Painter. Uh, I'm going to do a song that I quite like, and I hope you don't mind. Uh, I think it ties in quite nicely with the message for today. Uh, it is called, uh, Walt, the band played Waltzing Matilda, and uh, it was written by Eric Bogle and was uh, performed uh, by the Pogues. So here we go. Waltz, the band played Waltzing Matilda. When I was a young man, I carried my pack and I lived the free life of the rover. From the Murray's Green Basin to the dusty outback, I waltzed my Matilda all over. Then in 1915, my country said, son, it's time to stop a rambling cause there's work to be done. So they gave me a tin hat and they gave me a gun And they sent me away to the war And the band played waltz in Matilda As we sailed away from the key And amidst all the tears and the shouts and the cheers We sailed off for Gallup how well I remember that terrible day When the blood stained the sand and the water And how in that hell that they called Sula Bay We were butchered like lambs at the slaughter Johnny Turk, he was ready, he primed himself well he showered us with bullets and he rained us with shells And in five minutes flat he'd blown us all to hell Nearly blew us right back to Australia And the band played waltzing Matilda As we stopped to bury our slain And we buried ours and the Turks buried theirs who were living did their best to survive in that mad world of guts, blood, and fire. And for seven long weeks I kept myself alive as the corpses around me piled higher. Then a big Turkish shell knocked me off so tense. When I awoke in my hospital bed, saw what it had done, Christ, I wished I was dead, never knew there were worse things than dying, and no more I'll go waltz in Matilda, to the green bushes so far and near, for to hang ten, ten pegs, a man needs two legs, no more waltz in Matilda for me. They collected the crippled, the wounded and maimed And they shipped us back home to Australia The legless, the armless, the blind and insane Those proud wounded heroes of Sutta And as our ship pulled in a circular key I looked at the place where my legs used to be And thank Christ there was nobody waiting for me To grieve and to mourn and to pity And the band played waltz in Matilda As they carried us down the gangway But nobody cheered they just stood and stared, and they turned their faces away. And now every April I sit on my porch, and I watch the parades pass before me. I see my old comrades, how proudly they march, reliving the dreams of past glory. 
I see the old man all twisted and torn, the forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask me, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays Waltz and Matilda, and the old men still answer the call. But year after year, the numbers get fewer. Someday no one will march there at all. Waltz and Matilda, Waltz and Matilda, who'll come Waltz and Matilda with me? Okay, that's uh, the band played Waltzing Matilda. I'm gonna come back with a with a with a message. Okay, well, I quite like that powerful song, uh, and I quite like this um, passage I'm going to read now. Uh, this is let me get the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, February twelfth, twenty twenty three. The gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 37. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And you say, and if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if the right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your words be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Thus endeth the gospel. Wow, so powerful. And it is at this moment in this chapter that Jesus takes the hundreds of commandments uh, that uh, the people of Israel had to follow, uh, what to eat, what to wear, how to behave, what to do, it turns them on their head and makes them dynamic. It's not enough just to follow the rule and letter of the law. Even if you do it properly, if you're doing it wrong in your heart, you're wrong. I, and I, and I, I want to bring that to, well, a couple of things first. I, uh, when I worked in England, I worked next to a, a, an Orthodox Jew. He was in the same office with me. We were in the in the field of, of transnational education, and and I, I got to speaking to him because I didn't know a thing about Orthodox Judaism, just what I'd read here and there, and and so on. But here here was Michael who was sitting next to me, and so I I asked him one day, "Hey, is it true that you have to have like separate dishes for like dairy and meat and stuff?" And he goes, "Yeah, you, you have to." And I said, "Well, what? Well, why?" He said, "Well, because what, that's what we're commanded to do." I said, well, do you think God will love you any less if you don't do that? He said, no, it's an act of faith. 
it's an act of faith for me to do that. And, uh, and it struck me as, as very powerful that his following of the, these many rules were, were acts of faith on his part, demonstration of his faith. And, uh, and he, uh, he had to be home before sundown on Friday, on Fridays. And, and it was another one of these rules, you know. And in England, in the wintertime, sundown on Friday came really quite early because it's pretty far north. And, uh, and I, I remember going to work in the dark and coming home in the dark. Uh, and Michael had to, had to get home before dark. So he asked the boss, uh, general manager, if he, could, uh, if he could get off a bit early and he would make up the time. And, uh, and the people in the office acted like he was trying to get away with something. You know, they were like, you know, whispering to each other, oh, Michael just wants to get off early. He's just using his really, but Michael was very devout. And, and it was all he could do to, <laughs> to get in his car and drive as fast as he could to get home before sundown. And I, and I mention this because the rules that he followed bound his life so severely that he, he, he didn't have to think about whether it was in his heart or not. And here Jesus comes with a very dynamic message that says, well, you know, it's not enough to, if you lust after a woman, well, you've committed adultery in your heart. And it's not enough to, to just bring a gift to the altar. You need to reconcile with your brother and sister first. And I, and I look around at our world uh, at our world, and and I and I was struck the other day. There was an incident in the local school district here where a white boy, uh, a white boy, uh, made several racist gestures to this young African American boy, and uh, and and the young African American boy finally had enough, and. They went uh, at each other hammer and tongs, and both were suspended from school. And the mother of the African American boy wanted to get a hold of the mother of the white boy, and and get some reconciliation. Okay, Recon she called it, I think, reconciliation judgment, and uh, uh, justice, reconciliation justice. And the woman was not in the mother was not interested at all. And I thought right there in that moment, because I've had this passage in my head for some time, I thought right there in that moment, I know this woman's going to go to church, and she's going to pray, and she's going to do all the things that she thinks she's supposed to do, and yet she's unwilling to reconcile with her brothers and sisters in this community over an abhorrent incident where racism is abhorrent. Uh, you know, to judge, to be mean and cruel to someone based on the color of their skin is almost insane. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. They're no different. The people who aren't white are just not white. That's the only difference. And, and yet she was unwilling to make that effort. And then I look at our governor here, you know, who wants, who is doing away with he, she, pronouns, gender neutral pronouns for children, who is, uh, if, if, if a child comes out as a uh, as gay in school, the teacher has to call up the parents and tell the parents. And all of this is simply acts of, of aggression toward children, towards people, without really reaching out to understand who they are or why they are or why they're doing it. It's just hate. It's just legislating hate. And, and, it, and it's legal, okay? It follows the letter of the law. If they pass a law that says thus and such, then it's the law. We can't even have cultural sensitivity classes in the school systems because someone's feelings might get hurt. Someone, white person, might feel that, 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 that they're, they've done something. They might feel bad. And, you know, they probably ought to feel bad. They probably ought to feel terrible about the genocide committed against Native Americans, about the enslaving of an entire group, demographic of people that we imported from Africa, bred them like cattle, raped them, murdered them, to allow them to not even own property or have freedom of movement whatsoever. They were owned like chattel property to do with as we choose. And, we, we, and we're not supposed to talk about that. We're not supposed to preach that. We're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to teach this to the children in school. And instead, what happens to these children is they pick up the attitudes of their parents and they express them as this young white boy did 
to this young black boy. And, and it's terrible. It's, it's awful. It's cruel. And it is, <laughs> it is not Christian. None of this has anything to do with being a follower of Christ. None of this has anything to do with reconciliation or not sinning. It has everything to do with doing things that you will be judged for, not by others, but by God. You will be judged by God. My father, when I was a young man, I remember when Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered, and I was very angry. I was very angry and upset. And I thought, you know, I wish he could have been more like Malcolm X. I wish he could have been more like the Black Panthers. I wish he could have been more violent and stood up for, for the black folks. And, and I expressed this to my father. And my father said, Billy, you don't understand. Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. worked to liberate the black person. He worked to, uh, for better labor laws, you know, for black folks, for everybody. But his primary concern was to save the soul of the white person because it's the white man's soul that was at risk, not the black man's soul who was being oppressed. So when he says that his worst enemy were the white liberal churches, it's because they failed to stand up and do the right thing, that they were sinning in their heart, not not. They weren't enslaving anybody. They weren't lynching anybody, but they were allowing these things to happen. And Martin Luther King Jr. said, they are, they are the biggest obstacle that I have to overcome in the civil rights movement. White, liberal churches. And today we see these white Christian nationalists. They're not Christian. I, I don't even know why they think they are. They do nothing that resembles the life of Christ and so this song about waltzing matilda it's about you know a young man who roams around and doesn't have much of a care and 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 there's a certain innocence uh, that that we can appreciate in that you know he he wanders out in the countryside he's a rover blah 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 all that stuff and it's a you know maybe you might think oh well he, he's a ne'er-do-well you know but it's his life to live and then his government comes along and says you know Here's a tin hat. Here's a gun. There's work to be done. And he puts this boy on a boat and sends him to Turkey to fight against the Turks in World War I. And he doesn't know why he's there. And, he does, and yet he sees this terrible destruction, this devastation, this slaughter of the Turks and of his fellow men. And then he himself is wounded. And he goes back home to the shock of the people back in Australia who couldn't bear to look at him because he was the wounded, the maimed, the insane. You know, those who couldn't fight any longer. And so he followed the rules. He followed the law as all his comrades did. And they were shunned and they don't know why they died. They don't know why they were wounded. They don't know why their lives were wasted by following the law. And it's sad and it's tragic because that's what law and legalism does. It makes our lives sad and tragic. And Jesus comes with the good news and he says, resolve your problems, resolve your issues with your neighbors, resolve your issues with your brothers and your sisters before you go to court. And how many of us, how many of us do that? You know, I, if someone does me wrong, I want to get them back. But that's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to resolve it. And do the best that you can, resolve it, come to some just <laughs> resolution to the problem. And don't be like the woman who doesn't want to talk about it anymore. She'll be in church this Sunday, tomorrow. She'll be in church. Uh, dollars to donuts, she'll be in church. Feeling very... Uh, very sacrosanct uh, and self-righteous about her son. Well, that's my message. Uh, thanks for listening. If you if you did listen, glad uh, we've made it through the pandemic as much as we have. God bless everybody, and uh, see you in three weeks.